Today's sermon's entitled, Happy Father's Day. What makes a person a really good dad? When we think about the idea of father, we think of a person who is loving, kind, and filled with empathy and compassion. You know, the person who is consistently available to show us he cares, not only with his words, I love you, but also willfully and joyfully getting involved in our lives. It is in the walks, in the parks, the singing of the songs at a campfire, fishing trips, musical jamborees, and the family decorating the Christmas tree that results in us having fond memories of our dads. Is it not the person who picked us up, bandaged our scraped knees, and reassured us that, yes, we soon would be able to ride our bikes very safely and effortlessly, that we have great pride and great joy in calling him our father? Are not the men who goes to countless hockey, basketball, football games, dance, and music recitals that makes their loves for their children the most apparent? Absolutely. Surely the man who treats his wife with respect and kindness and great love goes a long ways towards creating an environment that is very secure and very safe for a child so that they can go out and they can explore this strange world that's all around them and it's not quite as frightening as it could be. A great dad is strong filled with wisdom, passion, and empathy. For he too knows what it's like to think that failure is one's inevitable destination when it really is just a stepping stone to learning and growing and being successful. While many people say that since every child is different, none of them ever come with a handbook, I don't think that's true at all. There is a handbook for all of our children. It's called God's Holy Word. It's a beautiful love letter that God has written to us, and he outlines his expectations of us raising his children. So we've got to read that and then trust, trust that God's going to help us get on the right path. The following sermon is not going to review every single characteristic that makes a really good dad. That would take far too long. However, I am going to look at specific dads within the Bible that can teach us both the right things to do and the wrong things to do when it comes to parenthood. I'm going to pick some of the major topics, some of the things that we wrestle with as dads the very most, and then we're going to look at the lessons that we can learn and then hopefully apply it to our lives. But let's look first and foremost to the very first dad. The first thing I think in fatherhood, and I remember when I first became a dad, is I need a compass. I really do. I need to stay on the right path. So I got thinking about Noah. If one is to successfully navigate the challenges that come from raising children, to be righteous while living in this fallen world, then we do need to have the right compass. In other words, we need to know the right direction to always go. That's not always easy, is it, Dad? Sometimes when our kids are out there and they're doing things or they're trying to make decisions in life and they're coming to us for advice or not coming to us, even worse yet, sometimes it's really hard to know what to do and how to, to encourage them, how, how to get them to grow in the right way and to seek the Lord. It's not always an easy task. One almost gets whiplash when you read at the very end of Genesis chapter number one that God made us and we were all very good. And then just seven to ten genealogies later, we find out the Lord saw that the people of the world were wicked. Every single person. He said their imaginations were completely wicked. You think it's hard to live in this me generation and we're supposed to think about whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, lovely, excellent, or praiseworthy. In Philippians 4, 8, it says, think about all these things, dad. Keep your mind good. Keep it pure. Imagine what it must have been like for Noah to raise three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, in the ways of the Lord when the whole world, except for them, had rejected the ways of the world, uh, the Lord and thought about nothing but worldly things. There would have been great pressure for Noah to conform to the ways of this world. Because not belonging to the ways of this world, it says in scriptures, will invite ridicule upon you. So he would have had great pressure from everybody except his own family to accept the things of this world and not accept the things of God. Anyone can handle momentary criticism, and I think we all can. Nobody minds, well, we mind it a little bit, but not too, too much to be criticized from once, once in a while. But what do you do when you go through what Noah went through in his family? It took them approximately 55 to 80 years to build the ark. And of course, while they're building the ark, they're demonstrating to the world that they believed in God and they were willing to obey God. Well, of course, the world, it said at that time, every single thought, every single motive they had was wicked. So they weren't thinking about God at all. And they were looking at Noah going, what are you doing? They had harsh criticism for many years. Can you imagine going 80 years of harsh criticism? People looking at you, laughing at you, poking fun at you, saying, what are you doing? It doesn't make any sense. 
Dad, it is possible to raise your children to be right in God's sight. Not based on your own strength, though. The only way that you're going to raise your children right is with the Bible, the Holy Spirit, and prayer as your compass to keep you on that narrow path. It's always tempting to look to the world and seek their advice and say, how do you raise your children? And, and if the ones that seem to be successful, it, it's always tempting to seek their advice. But the reality is, Dad, you want to look to the Lord. You've got to go to the Lord if you want to know how to raise them in the proper way in the first place. Like Noah, show your children how much you love God and how much he means to you by living his holy word, rejoicing in his blessings, not only in the good times, but the bad ones as well. That's not always easy to do, Dad. In those times that are really difficult within your family unit, maybe you're going through financial problems or marital problems, or maybe you're going through health issues, it's really hard to focus on God and give him the glory in all circumstances. But I think it's precisely, Dad, when you're going through the most difficult of times that you rely on God that you give the best testimony to your children of how much God means to you. And when you do not know what is the right path, take time to get in front of your children. Get down on your knees in front of them if you have to and show them that when you don't know the right path to take, you seek God's help. You're always looking to God to help make the right decisions in your life. And your children need to know that. They need to know that, yes, even you as a dad, you have times in which you're not really sure what you should do in life. And as a result of that, the first person you go to is not the world. It's to God and ask him, what do you want me to do? Looking upon the Lord gives you wisdom, strength, I think truth, courage to follow in his footsteps. And your children need to see that struggle for you to get there, but they need to see you picking up the compass of God's holy word and his spirit and in prayer and saying, yes, Lord, lead me and I will follow. Dad, may your children never see you conforming to the patterns of this world, Romans 12, 1 to 2, but instead see you always inviting the potter, the Lord Jesus Christ, to transform your mind into the image in which you are fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalms 139. They need to see that, Dad, very much so, because they're going to go through struggles, trials, and tribulations themselves, and they're going to have a lot of unknowns, especially when they're younger, and they're not going to understand what they should do. And when they struggle with that, they're going to be tempted to go out in the world and get advice there. That's not where they, you want them to go. You want them to go to God. So show them by your own actions how important it is to seek advice from God the Father in heaven. That's the first thing. So pick the right compass if you want to be a really good dad. The second lesson to learn is course corrections are absolutely necessary. Don't be too proud and don't be too arrogant, dad, to say I'm on the wrong path. I need to turn around. I need to go in a different direction completely because I'm not going where God wants me to. Dad, no matter how badly you fall short of God's glory, and we all do from time to time, show your children how important it is to offer your Creator a contrite and a broken heart and ask for forgiveness. Yes, Dad, there'll be many times that you won't be on the right path. And you're going to have to ask God, please forgive me, Lord, I'm not on the right path and I know it. And I've got to make a course correction, help me to do that. I want to talk about this other dad, and he's an example of not necessarily a very good dad, but he turned out well in the end, this guy, King Manasseh. And when he was 12 years old, he becomes king of all Jerusalem, Second Chronicles 33. His dad, Hezekiah, was a good role model who did what was good and right and faithful before God. And then it goes on and says, even when proud, pride was found in Hezekiah's heart, ultimately he repented and God's wrath didn't fall upon him. And thinking it was not worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, his son Manasseh, who became king later on, chose not to emulate his dad and the way his dad dealt with life and with God. Instead, he chose to go on the people of Noah's time, their path. Remember it said every single imagination, every thought they had, every inclination of their heart was evil. He decided to go that route. He decided to rebel against God. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had demolished, erected altars to the Baals, made a share of poles, bowed to the starry host and worshipped them, sacrificed his children in the fire of the valley of Ginhinnon, practiced divination, witchcraft, sought omens, consulted mediums and spiritists, and even had a foreign image placed within the Lord's temple his, in the Lord's temple himself. And I got thinking, you know, my, my goodness, he did everything he could to go against God the Father in heaven. Everything he could think of to tick him off, to make God angry at him. He did everything he could think of. So what could we ever possibly learn about this King Manasseh? What can we ever say to be a good dad, you want to emulate this? Well, we can learn a lot of lessons, some do's 
Um, a couple uh, do anyway, but mostly don'ts. Let's start off with the don'ts. First, Dad, be very careful to always want to obey the Lord in all that you do. The mighty arm of God's wrath and discipline is to be greatly feared. Just ask Manasseh, who was defeated by the king of Assyria, had a hook placed in his nose, bound with bronze shackles, and taken to Babylon to a dungeon prison. Second, another don't. Dad, there is no sin that cannot be forgiven by Jesus Christ. So make sure, Dad, that when you fall short of God's glory, that you're willing to ask for forgiveness. And this is a don't. Don't willfully sin against God all the time. Now let me go to a do. Do repent when you actually fall short of God's glory. That's the do. And that's what he did. It says in scripture that thankfully the story had a really good ending. Manasseh greatly humbled himself and he sought the Lord. He said, I got my compass out and I realize I'm on the wrong path. I got to make a course correction. I got to go 180 degree turn and go in the opposite direction I've been going. I got to embrace God. I got to get closer to God. And he's saying to himself, I've been doing it all wrong all this time. And he asked God to forgive him. And that's important. That was the do that he did. The really great thing. Dad, you're always going to make mistakes. You're always going to fall short of God's glory. None of us are perfect. And when you fall short of his glory, be ready to ask the Lord, please forgive me. Please give me forgiveness. For man aside, definitely worked out for him because it says the favor of the Lord fell upon him again. He was allowed to return to Jerusalem and reign as king again. And, and I got thinking, you know what? That's awesome. I mean, he did what he could to walk with God the Father in heaven again. If you do not begin well in your walk with God, and this is what I, why I bring up King Manasseh, and in fathering your children, you've made a lot of mistakes, as all of us have. Realize you shouldn't give up. Seek and draw near to the Lord. Ask for forgiveness and cry out to him, Abba, Father, and you shall find peace, wisdom, and forgiveness that surpasses all understanding. God is very gracious. He knows and he understands the things that we go through. And he doesn't say it's okay that we go against him, but he also understands how desperately we need to be forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness. So dad, when you really blow it, it doesn't mean that you're going to always be a bad dad. Manus approved that. The reality is you can ask God to forgive you. And the moment that you do, he's going to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and then get on the right path and live a good and holy life and show your children what it means to submit to God. So we got King Manasseh, who's kind of some don'ts and some do's, but certainly make the right course corrections. Lesson number three, trust God with the unknown future. To be a good father, one must trust the Lord with the unknown events in your life. Dead, we often face decisions concerning our children that are impossible to ensure a good outcome because simply there's no way of knowing the complexities of our current situation or what the future might possibly bring. In moments like these, the Bible tells us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Lean not unto our own understandings, but in all ways submit to him, and he will make our paths straight. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. While this sounds simple, it is very difficult to surrender our desire to have control over what is impossible to know, the unknown future, even to God who controls all things seen and unseen. Isn't that crazy? I mean, we struggle with that sometimes to say, God, you're in charge. God, what do you want me to do? God, show me the future. Show me the path. God, I don't want to sit and think about it forever and come up with my own strategy in life. I want you to tell me what to do and I'm going to do it. It's very humbling to say that to the Lord. I'm not capable as a dad or as a human being of getting things right on my own. I need you. Now that takes humbleness, but it's absolutely critical that we do. If we are to become really good dads, then let us learn to trust God like Abram did. When the Lord called Abram, he said to him, I want you to leave the country that you're in. And I want you to go to an unknown land. Now, God never told him where he was going. He was going to the land of Canaan, but he didn't know where he was going. God just said, I want you to go. You head out, Abraham, and you go. And that's all I want you to do. I want to see if you've got faith. And Abraham went. He showed a giant leap of faith when he got packed up all of his belongings, everything that he had, and he went out on the journey. Dad, sometimes God's going to ask you to do some things that you're not going to fully understand why. You're not going to fully understand all of God's reasonings because God's ways are higher than our ways. But when God asks you to do something, make sure, Dad, you say yes. I may not fully understand what you want me to do yet, Lord, but I can see the path that you've laid out before me. I'll take that path and I'll trust in you. 
Because Abram believed that God would come good in his promise, I will make you into a great nation, I'll bless you. I will make your name great, make you a great blessing upon this earth, Genesis 12, 2. Abraham took out his knife and was willing to slay his only son, Isaac, because he knew within his heart that God would come good on his promise and God would raise Isaac from the dead. He had absolute trust and faith in God. Abraham on that day demonstrated to his son that trust in the Lord would not falter. His trust, that is, would never falter no matter what God might ask him to do. Dad, in the face of the most difficult decisions, and especially in the valleys of the greatest turmoil, show your children your faith by asking, listening, and obeying whatever the Lord wants you to do, and show your children that that's exactly what you're doing. It's okay to tell the Lord that you often do not know how to rightly love, nurture, train, and protect the children He's placed in your care. It's okay to cry out to God, for when we do, He will tell you His perfect and pleasing will for your children and give you the strength, courage, and the ability to show them the narrow path that leads to righteousness through your faithful example of what it means to be holy. So that's really the the third thing. Trust in the Lord with the unknown future. Now I want to go to the uh, fourth example here. And it's don't overlook your child's wanderings. And this is really important, Dad, that you don't do this. I want to talk about uh, um, when your children wander away from the Lord, what do you do? Well, don't stand by idly. Don't stand by and say, I'm not going to do anything about it whatsoever. But instead, if you have to, discipline them if need be to help them understand how grievous it is to disobey the Lord. Let me tell you a story. Now, I know that as soon as I just told you that, you're going to say, yeah, but should we really try to get our kids to love the Lord? And should we really discipline them when they don't? And should we even discipline our kids at all? Let me tell you a story first, and then I'll tell you my answer to that. Let Let me tell you about Eli. Eli was a high priest. He ignored his son's wanderings. Eli had two sons, both of which he gave Egyptians names. One was Hophni, and the other one was Phinus. 1 Samuel 1, 3. They greatly angered God, for they had no regard for him. They treated him with contempt by making offerings unto him uh, that, that were not prescribed in the way they were supposed to. He also had great, they had great contempt for all the Israelites that came to the, to the temple. He also, they laid with a whole bunch of women who were serving at the entrance tent of the meeting. And as a result of that, they angered God greatly. And, and get this, both of Eli's sons were priests as well. So these these two sons who are priests were not even coming close to doing what was right in God's sight. And even though Eli rebuked both of his sons for their wickedness, he refused to either discipline them and or remove them from their priestly duties. As a high priest, he should have removed them. If it had been any other priest, he would have. He would have said, look, you can't be a priest anymore if you're going to be going doing some of those things. Those things all go against God. You're angering God. Therefore, I got to remove you. But since they were his sons, he decided not to. What Eli refused to do, God did by striking down both of his children. Both of them died in the prime of their lives. Dad, even though it's not popular in today's self-indulged, anything-goes culture to impose one's will upon another, especially our children, refusing to discipline your children fails to set the proper boundaries in their lives that reflect the will of God the Father in heaven. Remember, God disciplines those he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. Hebrews 12, 6. Dad, in disciplining your children, be careful, though. When I talk about discipline, of course, there's always going to be somebody out there listening to this possibly saying, yeah, yeah, but you know what? People in the past really disciplined their kids harshly and cruelly, and it was awful. And and I don't know, discipline's an awful bad word. I understand where they're coming from. There are many dads out there that discipline their kids in a way they shouldn't, in a way that is not considered okay. It's very cruel, and it's wrong on so many levels. But that's not the discipline the Bible's talking about. The Bible says, when you discipline your children, do not embitter them, do not exasperate them, but instead with great humbleness, gentleness, and with a constant willingness to forgive with open arms, choose whatever a loving and merciful God tells you to do in order to correct their behavior. In other words, it's not about you, dad, getting angry and bitter because your kids didn't do what you said. It's about you going in front of God and saying, God, they have broken your laws, Lord, and they've gone against you, Lord. What do you want me to do to help correct their behavior? And doing that in great humbleness, realizing that you're a sinner too. You know what? That's really important. And dad, if discipline doesn't work, and sometimes it doesn't, some kids you can discipline as much as you want, and they're still not going to listen. If that doesn't work, never give up. 
Always pray without ceasing. And, and whatever you can do is get in front of God and say, Lord, I can't help. I can't fix this situation. I'm going to live my life the best I can and show my children what are the right ways, but they're not listening to me. But God, I know you can remold them, reshape them, and get them back into your image again. I know you're the only one that can do that, God. So would you help me, Lord, do the right things in front of my children? Never stop inviting the, your children to be transformed and have their minds renewed by God the Father in heaven. So remind them, not only in the way you live, but remind them verbally that you're not in the right path and there's the path that God wants you to go. Just one fa final word on this fatherly lesson. Despite how wayward our children becomes ultimately, let, let us always send an example to them. Let's tell them how much we love them, how desperately want, we want them to accept the ways of the Lord. Let's show them by the way we live our lives. So that's important. So discipline is absolutely critical for, for us to be good dads. Lesson number five, don't show favoritism. And I think this is a really big one. And dad, I don't really think we do this on purpose. Love your children equally and fully without favoring one over the other. We don't really want to favor our children, but sometimes ultimately we're tempted to do so. We have all heard the expression, mama's boy, or daddy's girl, or, you know, daddy's, daddy's boy. We've all heard these expressions where, you know what, one parent favors a child over the other, and that never should be the case. When one of our children more closely resembles our talents, dreams, and goals, or are exceptional at doing certain things that makes us really proud, Dad, there's always a temptation to either love them more, which sometimes happens, or at least to give them so much praise that it appears like we're loving them more than the other children. And that cre creates a lot of problems with the other kids in the family. I'll give you an example. Jacob lived in the land of Canaan and had 12 sons. That's quite a lot. Because one of his sons, Joseph, was born in his old age, the Bible states that Joseph loved this son more than all the other ones and openly showed his favoritism by made a robe of many colors and placed it upon him. When Jacob's other sons saw that their father loved him, them, this, this other brother far more, the one son more than them, they started to hate him and they couldn't speak a kind word ever to him. So enraged with hatred for Joseph that they initially plotted to basically kill him. But then they decided, well, that's a little bit drastic. We don't want to do that. So they decided to sell him as a slave to the Ishmaelites for a mere 20 shekels of silver. In other words, let's get rid of him so he's no longer in the family. To make things even worse, they dipped Joseph's robe in goat's blood, presented it to their father and said, he's dead. He's long gone. Stop thinking about him. Now love us is basically what they were saying. Of course, their dad, Jacob, was absolutely heartbroken. Even though God used Joseph's bleak circumstances to pre prepare him for the way, ultimately become second in command of all Egypt and save many lives, Jacob, uh, Jacob did much damage to his family as a dad because he showed that favoritism. There was many years that these, these, there was friction within the family that never should have been there in the first place. Dad, your children are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of their creator. They have all been purchased at the price of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, John 3.16. And they can be saved, and they can receive the spiritual gifting needed to fulfill whatever divine role God assigns to them, 1 Corinthians 12. Whatever role God decides to give them is the perfect role for them, and as long as they're doing that role, they're of equal value in God's sight. Your role is to show them, your children, the eyes of Christ and the way you live your life, and to instruct them in the ways of the Lord, Deuteronomy 6.4-9. You are to love your sons and daughters equally and to never stop helping them to grow in their faith. Your love for them should not be based on what they do, but what God has already done for you and be truly thankful. So that's a big one. Don't show any favoritism at all. So let's go to the last one and, and lesson number six. God, the Father in heaven, must be your heavenly role model. That's so critical, very critical to get that. Dad, if you're looking for a role model, if you're looking for somebody to emulate, somebody using an example as a really good dad, then you need to look up to God the Father in heaven. I was very fortunate to have a God-fearing dad who trained me in the ways of the Lord that I should go, and he loved all my siblings equally. But I realize many of you don't have this kind of role model to look up to. Unfortunately, there are many dads out there that are abusive, non-loving, unkind, and absolute God-haters. If you happen to have such a dad, to whom to, are you supposed to look to for a role model then? If you're sitting back saying, you know what, I got my own children now. My dad was miserable to me. Maybe he was even abusive to you. 
then who do you look for a really good role model? I would encourage you, even if you did have a good dad, make sure you always pick God the Father in heaven as your role model, because that's absolutely critical. We need to emulate God because he's perfect. It states he has never sinned. He's never fallen short of, of God's glory at all because he is God. He is perfect in every way, shape, and form. He knows us, every piece of us, our heart's desire and everything else. And as a result of that, as our creator, our Lord, Savior, and King, he alone is worthy to teach us how to live good and holy lives. Scripture states that we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory, every single one of us, Romans 3.23. And if anyone says of us, any of us, hold ourselves up and say, I'm a really good dad, use me as a role model. Well, here's the reality. We have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We all have sin within us right now as we speak. We all do. We all have a problem with sin. Therefore, we're not perfect. God the Father in heaven is, though. If we aspire to become like any dad in the Bible, then God is the one we should aspire to become like. He who knit us in our mother's wombs is the only one who truly knows what his divine plan is for our children's lives. Only God is sinless, all-powerful, all-knowing, and filled with truth and justice for everyone. He alone is our creator and wants us as dads to succeed in raising the children he has given to us with a servant's heart in a start that ultimately wants to please him. I want to finish with this prayer for all dads who read this sermon. So I hope that right now, if you're listening, to just bow your head if you're a dad and you're struggling. And, and we all do, by the way. We struggle to know what, how to raise our kids rightly. I want you to pray this prayer with me. May the Lord, His Word, and Spirit be your guiding compass in raising the children God has entrusted to your care. When you sin against God, may you confess and get back onto the narrow path of righteousness. When you do not know how to raise your children rightly, then may you turn not to the world for advice, but to the known God of Israel and seek and obey his counsel. May you discipline your children not to embitter or exasperate them, but in great humbleness, gentleness, and with constant willingness to forgive with open arms. May you choose whatever merciful and loving God tells you as the form of discipline to use in your child's life. May you not show favoritism, but instead love all your children equally. And above all, God the Father always wants you to be the role model. He wants you to be a good role model for your kids, but he wants himself to be your role model, where you say, if I'm going to be any kind of father, I want to be like God the best that I can be. And dad, even if in following this advice, your children do not grow up to love the Lord, never stop showing them your intimacy and your obedience to the one who is your portion forever. For in doing so, you fulfill your obligation to a holy God to raise your children to the absolute best of your abilities. Dad, we're not responsible for the way our kids turn out. We're not. We can't control them. That's just a reality. They're responsible partially for the way they turn out. Absolutely. They got to make the right choices and the right decisions in life. Dad, your role is to show them God. Your role is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And your role is to love your children equally and in the same way. And your role is to show them and tell them and keep telling them about God and how great and awesome and amazing he is. That is your role. Now, if they reject all that, Dad, you're not responsible for that. You can't be held accountable for that because they got their own free will. But you will be accountable for the way you raise them. So tell them, tell them, tell them again all about Jesus and live your life for him and do the very best that you can. And when you don't know what to do, get advice from God the Father in heaven and he will show you exactly how to raise your kids rightly. I hope and pray that you have a blessed and wonderful Father's Day today and may God just show you his love and his compassion and his mercy and may you look to him and may he actually show you and you see it how to raise your kids his way. Amen.